Anybody else new to be with us this evening? Can you stand up, please? Sure. Carrie Wilson with HDR. Great. Thank you. And I'm Joe Hankey with HDR. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Um, I did want to, before we approve the agenda, I just wanted to mention one note. Um, in other boards and committees that I've sat on, um, I've used a consent agenda, and all that means is a couple of things like maybe what the agenda is and the minutes. Um, if you all would be up for it, um, would you consider having those two things be part of the agenda, the consent agenda, so we would actually approve those together going forward unless there was something that you wanted to pull out or add to the agenda or discuss in the minutes? So that's something we can discuss, or if somebody would raise that. If you don't have any problems with it, it zooms it through a little bit more quickly when there's nothing to discuss. Okay? Okay to go forward with that? Sounds good. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Tonight, however, um, I'll go ahead. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Also, um, public comments. Any other comments other than those agenda items that anybody might have? Okay. Um, approval of the minutes. Any changes or corrections? This is incredibly minor, but I was not here not representing the Independence Center. Um, I, I am noted as being here for the Independence Center versus the citizen at large. In the minute, okay. so just we'll make sure that's correct. Did you vote? I wasn't here, so <laughs> <laughs> not very effectively. Okay, could I have a motion to approve the amended minutes, please? So move. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, we'll move on. Uh, January Board of Directors report. Um, I can tell you it was lengthy because it was their annual meeting as well as their regular meeting. Um, their new officers were elected. Um, just for your reference, um, Council Member Andy Pico, City of Colorado Springs, will be the new chair. And then, uh, you know, for the most part, the rest of the officers, if you'd like me to mention them, I will. If not, they'll be in our minutes. Jacqueline, can you make sure they're in our minutes so everyone's aware? And then they also um, elected their stack committee, which remained the same as 2015. So I'm not sure that's a uh, need for mention. Um, the Regional Coalition for Strategic Federal Action, that impact group, their representative is the Town of Green Mountain Falls Mayor uh, Pro Tem Tyler Stevens. Um, joint land use study, which a couple of you have mentioned, just wanted to keep an eye out on. The representative from the board is the Town of Rama trustee, Turner Smith. So, Now, during the regular meeting, they thanked and recognized uh, Mark Snyder for his service to the board. And then they also approved Hannah's addition to our committee. So that's taken care of. And Ray Burgess of City of Woodland Park to the CAC as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, there were some updates from CDOT, from Mark Andrews on all the construction projects. And the two military representatives, the two colonels from the military installations, there was one from Air Force as well as uh, Fort Carson, um, gave us updates on what they had going on. So it was pretty straightforward. Um, I presented the CAC report and let him know that we were discussing our terms. And just ahead of time, um, technically they need to approve allow us to have the conversation as part of our current bylaws. <coughs> so we'll go forward with that and put together a meeting. And then uh, Rachel also gave a legislative update and requested that the board provide direction on taking positions. So what you saw and what you will see in our agenda is that she's going to give a little show and tell on the legislative issues. And it was also in our meeting packet. Um, if you have comments on those, you'll just want to go ahead and we'll discuss what's the best way to go forward if we want to comment on any of those as a group. Okay? So good? Okay. Um, there were a bunch of other information items, but I have to tell you, 90% of them were ones that we had already discussed in our meeting because we met the week prior. Just, I think it was 10 days prior. 
So that's that. So we'll move on to item six, and I, I want to um, comment on a couple of things that were in the packet. Um, I want to thank um, JDS Hydro for the uh, absolutely detailed um, work from the consultants that was in there. It was a very complete package, so that made it easy to understand everything. And also thank Scott for um, putting photos of where the changes would be occurring with regard to item seven. So. I appreciate the detail. Hey, Ken, if you'd like to get started on item number six, please. Good afternoon. I'm Ken Prather, the acting uh, environmental program manager here at PPACG. PPACG's role in site applications is to review uh, new sewage treatment facilities, expansions, or lift stations, which are pump houses. Uh, to try to in, in provide the technical assistance in, in having a complete and accurate application to, to help the applicants in the region, as well as to address issues of regionalization and consolidation. So we don't have a lot of small wastewater treatment facilities. We get better efficiency, better uh, water, wastewater standards if, if we have larger facilities rather than a whole lot of little ones. Woodland Park has been operating its uh, wastewater treatment facility since 1992. It meets our definition of a regional wastewater treatment facility. Uh, they're, because of population growth, they're projecting uh, to, to come in the next few years. They're proposing to expand it to, to handle this uh, increased growth. Uh, so it's all on the existing site. Um, I have several technical experts here to answer any detailed questions you might have. The uh, Site Application Review Committee, which is the, the subcommittee of the Water Quality Management Committee, they're the ones that really dig into the, the nuts and bolts and the details. Uh, they had no technical recommendations. They had some wordsmithing typographical uh, suggestions. Those were made pretty much on the spot when that met. So the Water Quality Management Committee has met, reviewed this, and is unanimously recommending approval. So we present it today for your your review and your action. Okay. Do any of you all have any questions? Pretty straightforward. Now. That was smart enough. Okay, Ken. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to approve? Second. Second, please. Second. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm just looking across the room. at the same time you start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All those. I'm sorry, but um, I do have a question. Is now the time to ask that question? Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was daydreaming or something. Um, where's the money coming from? How much is it? And what is the impact both up in, I guess, what wouldn't park area? And is there any impact on the rest of El Paso County? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little bit of overview real quick, and then I, hopefully I'll catch each one of your questions. Um, yeah, this time we didn't bring a controversial project. So. Um, Woodland, City of Woodland Park is probably one of the, uh, the best actors in the state of Colorado in terms of compliance on the wastewater side and water quality. They discharge to uh, Trout Creek, which is a, a higher mountain uh, stream. This particular expansion is of a plant that's been operating for 23 years straight with very little uh, changes or improvements. So they've got a lot of mileage out of this plant, zero violations, and they intend to keep it that way. And for that reason, they're making this expansion, which will not only add um, hydraulic capacity, but a significant amount of organic capacity and take uh, the wastewater treatment to a much higher level than they do now. They will take it beyond what's required by the state. They're going to go to full tertiary treatment uh, as well as secondary and advanced uh, wastewater treatment. So they are really moving. They have always been one to move the ball ahead of everybody else. Move directly into your question. I believe your first question is how much does it cost? Uh, the project's $8.5 million um, anticipated. Uh, they built the first phase of it for about $1 million in... Uh, 2011, which is the initial headworks facility. There was a reason for phasing it that way and getting that done ahead of time. 
The project is funded by uh, the CDPHE through their Power and Water, Water and Power Authority grant, or loan pro process. So it's being state funded uh, through through that 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 avenue. And I'm sorry, but I'm old and I've already forgotten your secondary questions after that. Um, is there any impact to either El Paso County or others outside of Woodland Park in terms no. of cost, taxes, things of that nature? El Paso County, there's zero. Now, this is in Teller County, and it's in entirely in the Teller half. Um, as, as you well know, El Paso comes right up to, and actually some of the outskirts of Woodland Park are in El Paso County. All of the wastewater is discharged to uh, what we call Division One, which is the Platt system, not the Arkansas system. So uh, the impacts, at least water-wise, are strictly uh, – uh, north side strictly plat. Um, there are a few customers in the system. I want to say 800. Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, there are 800 uh, customers who are not inside the city who are served wastewater uh, facilities. So rate structures and so forth, it would impact those folks. But they use the wastewater system, so that's, that's appropriate. Um, other parties that's impacting, one of the things that they intend to do is go to tertiary treatment, although they only have a small amount of the flow that's going to go to the, new, to the golf course up there. They're going to recapture, reuse there. They're going to treat the entire flow to a tertiary level. So anybody downstream, and, and it's quite a ways downstream, of course, but uh, we'll see a higher quality water than the state is actually asking for. So the golf course would have an impact. But the city is wanting to do that because how it manages the water resources within its area it wants to use the resource uh, in that fashion. Okay. Um, the other, the only other question I had is I saw um, sludge composting. Yes. Was that selected as as the final design? That is in place now. That was selected in 1990. It's one of the few uh, operating composting systems in the state by municipality. <coughs> And uh, um, when you look at a, um, a very excellent model, all of the compost from the <coughs> facility has been used by, by others in the composting. They give compost to any citizen of the city, free of charge, to whatever extent they want. Outside of that, all of the excess compost has been spoken for for three years. That's how in demand it is, and one of your big users is right here. Call our Department of Highways. This is one of the biggest users of, uh, of, the, of that, that byproduct. Go ahead, Bob. In, in the reading that I did, there was, I thought there was part of the system that went into Fountain Creek and thus into the Arkansas system. But th is, that the pro is that the original? System that does that, that would have been 30 years ago. Okay. If you guys, all of you, I know everybody's kind of Colorado Springs oriented, but we've all been up the pass. So uh, as you come into town uh, and you look off to the left where the, they've kind of moved the rodeo grounds to, they used to have two wastewater plants. One was at that site up until the 1992 plant. The other was out on 67 where this site is. That plant discharged the fountain. This one discharges to the uh, Rule Creek and Trout Creek. That was done away with in 1990, so since that time, there's been no discharge to the fountain side. A lot of people don't know that Woodland Park sits right on that little divide where half coast yeah. on the saw and half coast on the Now, we do have wastewater that comes down there, but we have big pump stations down at that site. You'll see a little building, and there's an underground facility there, and then another one on down the valley that we pump everything back and over the, the divide. So so that's how it's handled. But it runs uphill? It <laughs> runs uphill. <laughs> because we pump it, though. Does it necessarily gain speed? <laughs> so it, obviously that's a, you know, as you think about the city of Woodland Park that breaks the divide between Division One and Division Two, why that's how we handle it. But 
That decision was made many years ago, and it was made on a water rights basis, more, even more so than a water quality basis. A lot of their estimates are upon, uh, we have the new college, and it's expanding. Uh, we have a new Best Western, it just got voted in mm -hmm. uh, at the last council meeting. The, uh, we're having a new large Goodwill system go in. Uh, we have the new apart multi-level apartment complex, and none of us even know how many apartments are in it. So some of the people don't like the growth, but the town's going to grow. And because everybody's moving up the pass to do that. So we have, it, it made a lot of sense to have the expansion in where it's at. So does it ever go from this to a lift station at some point in time when the population reaches a certain amount? Well, um, when you say go to a lift station, obviously a lift station is only a pumping device that moves waste, raw wastewater from one point to another. So there always has to be a plant somewhere. So um, you can only replace a plant with a lift station if you're pumping it somewhere else. Now, in this case, I mean, we're talking to the next large, large regional plant. We're talking Colorado Springs Utilities on Las Vegas, so we're talking 40 miles. So it's not a, a very feasible option. Scott? Um, thank you. I appreciate this. I was very aware of both the apartments, um, the Bible College, and the hotel. I was involved in a couple of those on a commercial level, and that was going to be one of my questions. So thanks for asking. For adding that, I noted you've got your planned up to 13,760, and so you're exceeding your 2030 projections. Is there any more capacity able to be added to this station? Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah, you could go farther. Um, the city's going to be limited, probably, you know, by other factors, um, uh, land, water, and so forth, before they're limited by the ability to treat the wastewater, probably. And those of us that live in the Fountain Valley appreciate you shipping it to the other side of the hill. So. <laughs> hey, hey, as, as nice as we're treating it, I'm sure you would appreciate having it on this anyway. side. So. <laughs> the grass is greener. Yeah, you're probably, yeah. All the questions? Yeah, family that, that. Were there any other comments? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Our next item, Mr. Phillips, welcome back. <laughs> it seems like we were just here yesterday. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Scott Phillips, Transportation Planner, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Uh, before you is uh, amendment, uh, tip amendment number 11 for the uh, fiscal 2016-19 uh, transportation improvement program. Uh, this is a probably one of the more uh, complex amendments that we've brought before you, or at least I have in the past few months. Um, and if you'd like, I can just go ahead and run through it and you answer questions. Synopsis sure. Uh, well, the synopsis is uh, there are multiple uh, additions to the tip, right? Uh, uh, majority of them coming from CDOT, uh, which is positive for the area where we're adding additional funds, adding projects to the region needed and necessary projects to the region, region's transportation network. Um, this amendment incorporates uh, five different requests, which incorporate uh, uh, multiple requests within that request. Uh, our first one, <laughs> uh, the, the very first one is uh, an addition of two new projects to the region utilizing both highway safety improvement program funds and uh, hotspot funding, uh, the total of $860,000 is a combined project, uh, two projects. One is on uh, State Highway 16 and Mesa Ridge Parkway, and the other one is on uh, State Highway 21 and Bradley Road. One, uh, the Bradley Road project is the installation of a new signal, turn signal, and the one on Mesa Ridge is the addition of a left turn lane. Any questions on that one? Yeah. yeah. Um, two of them. The signal there at, at uh, Powers and Bradley? Yes. Is that in preparation for Bradley Road cutting through from where it currently terminates uh, basically at Grinnell and going all the way through to Powers? So the western piece of that's going to be finished and it'll be four way at that point? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'm Mark Andrew with CDOT. And uh, the question. Uh, we, we addressed that yesterday in a meeting uh, because the county was there. Uh, we had a scoping meeting on that project. And that, that question came up. Uh, 
should we accommodate the signal to the, the widening to the west? Because we got to connect that into Grinnell someday. So the team is aware that we've that design exists, and we want to be able to accommodate at least the the signal and underground improvements to to that that future connection. So the infrastructure so will be in for the infrastructure will be in correct. Okay. So, but we won't provide the actual signals for that that movement, obviously. So. <laughs> well, the antelope might appreciate it, but right now that's about it. The um, left turn lane on 16 and Mesa Ridge Parkway. There's already left turn lanes there. So. There is, and I I knew this question was going to come up, and I'm I know they're adding a left turn, but I think it's on on the side road um, because we already you're correct we already do have the left turn, but I can't comment for sure exactly where that left turn is going directions, in. Directions, it's left turn. Right, and I think they're adding an, an additional left turn or accommodating for a dual left turn. Because of the yeah. volumes is, okay. is, but I can I can bring some better information back. And that would be on the board. Powers Corridor, space, correct? Not the Mesa well, Ridge side. I I think that's on State Highway 16, which, which is, is the powers, which is, is considered yeah. the Powers connection. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. You bet. Any other questions? <clears throat> Go ahead now. What qualifies as a hot spot? Uh, hot spots are areas of high CO concentrate. So, like a okay. turn signal, a heading turn signal. You're having a long, you know, people are sitting there um, waiting for the signal, so you're increasing your CO2. There's a, a pretty intensive studies that go in prior to them uh, addressing and selecting projects to utilize those funds. And hotspot funds are federal funds that come in the state uh, specifically utilized to uh, mitigate high concentrations of CO in certain locations. Yeah. Um, our second item on the table here is uh, another request. Uh, this is uh, adding um, adding a few dollars to our CMAC pot for uh, fiscal year 15-16. Uh, 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 these funds are coming from reconciliation from last year. Uh, if you'll see the CMAC funds that we're adding uh, 9,340 additional dollars in CMAC uh, and then also an additional uh, $2,099 in transportation uh, our TAP funds. Um, additionally to that, um, which we don't have in the table yet, we will be meeting with our local jurisdictions, is a decrease in our STIP Metro pool funds. Uh, that decrease is $84,992, or excuse me, $92, yes. Um, we're not the only, every MPO in the state is being asked to uh, adjust their STIP Metro funds downward. Uh, this will have an effect uh, with some, with a, at least when one or two or three projects we'll have to go through uh, and uh, workshop it with our uh, project sponsors uh, to see where those additional funds uh, may come from. We will bring this back to you at a later date. Uh, also, in addition to that, there's a decrease of $7,700 in our planning monies that are, uh, that are contracted, that PPACG gets and it's contracted uh, through CDOT. So any questions on that as we move forward uh, we are <clears throat> swapping out some projects um, CDOT and the city of Colorado Springs uh, city of Colorado Springs has uh, uh, decided to accept the uh, sponsorship and responsibility for three projects and uh, swapping out uh, utilizing PPRTA funds to uh, to get the projects at State Highway 21 in Constitution, State Highway 115 in Brookside, and State Highway 115 in Ramona and Washington. Uh, with that swap, uh, uh, our ex taking over the responsibility or sponsorship of those projects, CDOT is moving forward with adding three projects on US 24 uh, in the Woodland Park area. Uh, they're identified as um, uh, US 24 in West Street, uh, 24 in Baldwin Street, and 24 in Fairview Street. These are all uh, signal adding signals to uh, improvements uh, at those locations. Uh, moving ahead, uh, additionally, two more hotspot projects are being added on the 24 corridor in Woodland Park too. One is the installation of a high-intensity activated crosswalk system, better known as Hawk. And the other one is on Morning Sun, and that's installing a flashing beacon. Um, and that's, uh, those two, again, are in Woodland Park. Uh, the last amendment item on this is 
uh, adding additional funds of uh, faster and uh, safety, our surface treatment funds to the I-25 North Widening Project. Uh, the funds are being uh, have been approved by the Transportation Commission, and the additional funding is necessary to uh, pay for additional erosion control work and overlay work. Uh, those are both uh, faster safety dollars of 1.3 million and surface treatment dollars in 2017 of 1.85 million dollars. Uh, we TAC has uh, recommended. Uh, approval for the board, and we request that the CAC also recommend approval to the board of this amendment. Thank you. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any concerns regarding um, the, <laughs> the alteration in the left turn lane that might exist, or any concerns about the way this will be adjusted? I didn't see any reason to hold it up. I mean, I I have a question. Ahead. Did the city actually acknowledge that they're going to take over those three projects? That are being I haven't received correspondence, but uh, we have correspondence from CDOT saying they will, and I have mm -hmm. talked to uh, representatives of the city, and they're moving forward with it. So, I have a quick question. Is there any um, significant change as far as funding goes then? Mm -hmm. uh, no. Okay. Uh, it's added. We're bringing more projects to the region, and actually, what's really uh, what's really kind of nice is Woodland Park is seeing some action up there with some <laughs> transportation projects that typically, in the normal tip, uh, uh, they uh, they don't have any projects in the tip. So this is uh, excellent for the city of Woodland Park and improvements along the 24 corridor. The, the signals that you're talking about these are improvements to those signals. Correct. Correct. Yes, they're, they're, they're upgrades. They're upgrades or and an old so improvements. These signals are already there. These are because if you just look at this and saw install a signal, you can see they're already there. There's just needed some improvements needed for it. Uh, the Hawk system is going to be a new thing, though, right? Correct. Correct. So that's, that's a good spot too. Yeah. Much that needed. Too. Yes. Uh, yeah, Bob. Talk to us just a little about the I-25 widening north project and the compromise that took place. And I don't understand what happened there. And I don't, I'd like to know where it is, too. So during the project, um, Kiewit, the contractor, encountered a lot of soft spots and that they didn't anticipate. Um, the soft spots were fairly deep. and they, in their bid documents and escrow documents, didn't show that they anticipated that work. So it was what we call a differing site condition or unforeseen condition. Uh, we reimbursed the contractor for that work. Uh, we agreed that we would reimburse 80% of that, agreeing that 20% of it was really on the contractor. So it was a negotiated amount. Um, with that said, the contractor did lose some productivity, and he was under the contract was allowed some reimbursement for loss of productivity too. So those two things combined for about $3 million to finish up that I-25 widening project. The original project was around a 70, 75, $77 million project. So it was, um, you know, a, a large amount, but given the size and the complexity and of the, the, the soft spots we encountered, it, it's not unusual for that size of project to have those type of situations. So, so. it boosted to about $80 million then? Is right. It, on top of that, that $3 million also includes um, additional work or betterments that we uh, reimbursed the contractor for after some pretty severe flooding that we had that was really beyond the contractor's control. We had lost some facilities up there, some drainage <coughs> facilities, and we we reimbursed the, the contractor for that repair. So all the additional three million was um, added to the project, and again, the faster safety money of 1.3, that's additional funds. It doesn't count against current projects, and then the 1.85 million of surface treatment funds came out of our surface treatment pool for a project that we are going to delay on Nevada Avenue, <coughs> simply because the city has plans to improve Nevada Avenue um, south of I-25 and. It makes sense to delay that surface treatment because the city's going to get in there in the next few years and do improvements. So, so those combined, we were able to 
Mark, I have a quick question. From when, we, when we scope the project before it goes out to bid, do we do we um, take into or does CDOT take into account the condition? Or are, how much evaluation is done prior to the project? Yeah, it depends on the on the project. You you want to be able to get a good idea of the subsurface conditions, uh, but you can't see them all, and you don't anticipate that you're going to run into um, you know necessarily poor material in in sporadic locations. So you do the best you can. Um, sometimes even with the boring information you get, it's not it's not enough to really show the real um, condition under that 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 pavement or that that future roadway so it really comes down to risk in this case it depends on how you write the contractor co contract if the contract says contractor assumes all that risk you typically get a higher bid price because of that risk so I mean there's there's really two ways to do it yeah. we elected to do it not giving the contractor that much risk that we were going to assume some of that based on the information that we had. So you pay for it one way or the other is what I'm trying to get get to. Okay. Do we have any other? Yes. I had, and excuse me if, if I'm just exhibiting my ignorance, but at some point I get used to that. There's a picture in here about removing a signal project, North Powers and Constitution, but I I'm probably just missing it. I'm looking. There, yeah, there it is. Okay. There, there, it's Power there. Constitution well, continuous flow. So there, we're taking traffic signals out of that. No, the, we're not improving the signals. Okay. So what we have there are span wire poles. We're removing oh. the signal project that was proposed Correct. to improve. Correct. Okay, not removing. I read that and I looked at that and I went, well, that, gosh, that can't be. So thank you. And, Apologize. And the thinking there is that we want to look at improving those intersections sooner rather than later rather than spend the money there and have to, to waste that money on a future signal or mass arm which is very expensive we want to be able to maybe potentially improve that intersection we're looking at a continuous flow intersection as an option there some point um, that's supposed to be an overpass there uh, ultimately it's a great separation yeah. because power someday is is a freeway um, but if we can do improvements that will get us 10 to 20 years with a continuous flow intersection, we'd like to, to look at that option. So we're, we're tabling the, the uh, signal improvements until we can, you know, make a better decision on that intersection. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what, is, what is your outlook or the outlook with regards to the S STP Metro funding? Um, this shows a decrease of $85,000, which isn't a huge amount of money. But do you, uh, do you see other changes coming at us in the future that might be bigger and more impactful? Yeah, maybe Scott can address that. Um, well, with, with the recent um, approval of the FAST Act, um, we estimate we might see maybe a 1% reduction in our overall funds that we receive uh, regionally. Uh, we haven't received the new estimates uh, as of date. Um, however, we're anticipating those in the near future. Uh, currently, uh, the 85,000 that we're being hit with, uh, all MPOs are being hit. Uh, DR, Dr. Cog's being hit uh, $340,000. Front Range is being hit by about $11,000. Uh, so we're all feeling the pinch, and these are based on uh, estimates that they provide us. And then at the end of the year, when you reconcile the numbers and what we ex what were, was expected in regards to revenues coming in, were, did not equate to the revenues that were provided by FHWA. So, I would say I would say right now, once we get the new updated estimates uh, from the Fast Act, uh, we'll be able to have a better eye on it. I, they're usually pretty tight. I've personally never experienced where we saw where there's a reduction like this, but. Um, uh, I, again, they're they're working. Those estimates that they provide us go out for ten years. So, you know, it's just one of those those blips on the radar screen. Fortunately, it's a relatively small amount of money. Yes. What is the what is the percentage that eighty five thousand represents? Eighty five thousand on the funding that we receive for Step Metro that comes to about it's less than one percent. So, 
Okay. Uh, our, okay. our annual step metro is around $7 million, seven and a half, so $85,000 is, although it does affect, I mean, it does have an effect, and we have to figure out where the, it's where we're going to go and, and, and grab the, find those dollars, and that's going to be workshopping it okay. with our project sponsors, and, and uh, we'll come back to you uh, with that information, and uh, hopefully move forward. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved. And a second? Second. Any further questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay, item number eight, please. Yes, uh, this is the information item. That's amendment number 12, which is an administrative amendment to the TIP. Uh, this is adding um, uh, $1.19 million to the Rainbow uh, Falls Bridge project. That project has uh, previously been spoken about at, I believe, all our committees. Uh, I, if you're unaware, the initial funding that was allocated to it uh, by CDOT uh, was below the estimates that were being provided. And I, my understanding of this project has gone through a couple bid processes. And this will hopefully amend or our, our fill the, short, the shortage of funds uh, so they can move forward and get some um, uh, get bidders interested in the project and get the project moving forward. Uh, the second one is the city of Colorado Springs is modifying uh, their local match uh, for the Platte Avenue Bridge replacement project. Uh, they're replacing local dollars uh, with uh, PPRTA dollars. Uh, interesting note on that is the actual local match is being increased by two whole dollars. So, uh, again, that, that is taking some of the weight and responsibilities off of the uh, city's general fund and uh, being supplemented by PPRTA dollars. Yes. Was that a voter-approved PPRTA project? I would have, I'm not sure of that. I'll have to, I'll, I'll look into it and come back to you about it. Pardon? We've approved that project in the past, recommending approval. But the PPRTA is approved by the voters and not up for change without voter input. So I guess my question was, is how do we move money out of a PPRTA project into a non-voter approved project? Those are restricted it's a city funds. Project, wasn't it? I will, um, I, can, I can look into, I can get answers for you. That, and you know, the city essentially just sent, sent us a request saying the board has already made that more. decision is that what you're saying correct yeah, yeah. and it did go through the PPRTA board for them to be able to move the, uh, to transfer funds as well as the city uh, city council okay. any other questions on this uh, I'm trying to figure out where Sand Creek flows under Platte Avenue where, where does that happen? West of Powers. Where? West of Powers. West of Powers. Just, oh, just by the old, yeah. uh, by the uh, old uh, case equipment. Yeah. 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 By the yeah. store. Yeah. That new okay. FedEx yeah. facility. Thank you. So, and with that, uh, this has already been uh, uh, approved by the uh, transportation director here at PPRTA and the amendments move forward. This is just information and let you know that there have been actions on these oh, projects. Yeah, they pull it out of the maintenance funds. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get it. Okay. Hey, thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Casper. No motions on that one. Information. So, uh, this is an information item. Uh, good afternoon, Craig Casper, Transportation Director. Uh, information item, we will be bringing this back for action next month. Uh, the TAC, uh, El Paso County proposed, and we had a discussion at TAC. There's a category of funding at the federal level called emergency relief that can only be given to areas that have suffered a declared disaster, and it's solely for build, rebuilding infrastructure. So the uh, emergency relief funds... Um, can o and the process to do that is a federally run process. It doesn't even, you know, hit CDOT so much. It's uh, at the Federal Highway Administration. Our current TIP admin amendment policy does not let uh, me put those funds in administratively. It requires us to go through the month-long 
uh, TAC CAC board process. And um, El Paso County has uh, pointed out that really the only the thing that PPACG can do is approve it. Uh, there's no, um, I guess, process for an MPO not accepting emergency relief funds. So uh, the suggestion was made, let's amend our, our TIP amendment policy to let emergency relief and not funds that are considered emergency, but the kind of funds that are actually called emergency relief, and let those go in administratively so that I can just sign off on it and it goes right into the step. Move approval. <laughs> it's almost too logical. Yeah. I, I just have one quick question. That had to do with, Craig, how do you all decide which projects are going to be addressed under that particular emergency funding? Do you have to submit yeah, these projects? My understanding is CDOT submits them, okay. and the feds say, yeah or no, and there has to be the declared disaster. I mean, there's a whole oh, I know checklist of things to get ER funds. So, okay. and, there, and even then, it's limited to $100 million per state. So with CDOT's, uh, the floods having like $300 million worth of damage, eh, you're only getting $100 million out of the feds. So. Okay, Hal. I'm going to ask your question again just to be so that I, I'm clear. Uh, it sounds like the process that you're recommending is correct, but the funds go designated projects that have already been submitted. And a huge vetting process, yep. Thanks. So. But I want to give you a heads up. Next month, we'll be uh, bringing this back as an action item. So. Okay. Any other questions for Craig today? Oh, it's just discussion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Mark. I believe you're up, sir. Without the opportunity. I'll try to make this as brief as I can. There's a lot of information, but what we really want to focus on today. <laughs> is our 2020 faster safety and regional priority program and, and projects that we're proposing for Pikes Peak. Um, we already have projects slated in, the, in our STIP and TIP for um, projects from 16 through 19. Um, but this is, again, information to give uh, to the board here to, to, to give us some feedback. Um, we've talked to the TAC. Uh, about some of these projects and and um, you know these these are fairly much in line with the uh, PPACG's priorities in terms of getting projects either shelf ready or addressing safety safety projects so the first um, spreadsheet that I'm sending around and there should be enough copies for everybody in this room um, is what we're proposing for our 2017 through 2020 and the next um, list, send that one around too, is a, a list of projects that are from 2020 through 2025. So what I want to give you is a snapshot of a 10-year program. The first four years are really is, the, the first four years really is what we want to put in our step and tip. The next four or five years is what we want to put out there for potential projects that we're looking at. But what I want you to take away is that the funding over that 10 years is consistent with our RPP funding that we do get for Pikes Peak. So we get about $40 million over that, well, yeah, $40 million over that 10 years. Um, and so if you were to add up all the projects and funding that we've received over that 10-year period, it's going to show about 40 million of RPP. Um, our faster safety program, on the other hand, is really driven by uh, what we call benefit cost. It's driven by uh, whether you're eligible based on safety improvements. And we have gotten quite a bit of money, faster safety money, too. So what I'd like to do quickly is just go through um, each of these lists and tell you what we're proposing, what money we already have. Uh, the first, again, is the 17 through 20 list. It's the, um, the first one I handed out. And again, I'm just going to qu go quickly through these, but stop me if you have any questions. Um, the first one, we're doing acceleration lane on South Academy. That's already a current project that's funded. Uh, the, the Cimarron uh, interchange ramp really is the Cimarron interchange. 
um, that money went into Cimarron, and that money is being spent. Uh, the U.S. 24 wildlife fence is already in the tip and stip. However, we may look at that that project and shelf that project uh, and put that money in 21st or 31st Street because we think we can get better um, safety improvements at those locations. The issue with the wildlife fence may be that we don't have good crossing for game. And so we can collect the animals with fencing, but we really don't have any place to cross them underneath 24. So this, this project, even though it was initially scoped, probably needs to be pushed back until we get some future overpasses, underpasses built on 24. Um, so again, it, it currently is in the STIP. Um, the Powers XL B cell lane, there is $2.2 million that we're that we've just received, um, that is is currently going in through the tip step process to be added to the Powers Auxiliary Lane project. We had some additional lanes or projects that were sitting on the shelf that the commission asked if you have projects ready to go, you can apply for additional faster safety funding, and we did. So that 2.2 million is additional. So now I'm on the Fifth project down, the I-25 North Winding project. We talked about the 1.3 million of faster safety that's being added to that project to close that one out. Um, 21st and 31st Street. Each 21st Street has about 2.5 million to make improvements, uh, including additional left turn lanes and looking at signal improvements as well. 31st Street, similar type approach. We want to look at the left turn storage, maybe add additional lanes as well. And what you're not seeing on here, and I, I noted it here, you're getting 1.7 million of additional HSIP, which is a different category of safety funds. Um, so that project will likely go to about 2.5 million or 2.2 million. Um, State Highway 21 right-of-way preservation, Current, again, it's in the stip and tip, um, and the design is in the stip and tip. So we're looking at, uh, as development occurs on that corridor, we want to be proactive in, in preserving the future right-of-way for that freeway. Um, in addition, we're looking at uh, trying to get projects more shelf-ready on, on powers, uh, such as Constitution or... Uh, research, um, potentially an interchange. If we can get that one shelf ready, we may be able to, you know, compete for money if it falls out of the sky. So that's that's the intent. Um, State Highway 21 widening plat to Fountain. That project currently uh, is out to construction. Um, that money is already in that project. Uh, the Wellington Gulch sediment removal. That's additional money that we've just added to our tip and stip uh, to assist with some sediment uh, removal up there with the COSP, that group up there. Uh, the 24 overlay Constitution of Garrett, again, a future project that we want to resurface that segment for the westbound lanes. Um, and again, that's going to be faster safety to pay for that. Um, in addition to that, we're going to re- uh, do the intersection at there at Garrett and 24 and improve the traffic flow for that intersection. So that 1.7 million is mainly going to that project. Um, 8th Street right away in design. We're leaving this project in as a placeholder, but likely that money will be suggested to be moved to either 21st or 31st Street if we need it because we were able to make improvements at 8th Street with the, the Cimarron Interchange project. Um, we were able to get additional um, improvements through the bidding process to improve 8th Street with what we call the three-quarter CFI there. So that's, that's on our website if anybody's interested in that. Um, so that money we're, we're, we're suggesting maybe is not a good place for that right now, and it probably should stay on the corridor, but make improvements at other, other locations. Um, we have a commitment 
Now I'm getting into the 2020. Again, this isn't in the STIP, a million dollars um, from PPACG to go into a planning study for 24 East, which will help get projects ready to go on that corridor as well. And then one of the changes that we did suggest making is taking money from the US 24 corridor at 8th Street, a million dollars, and put it in into the I-25 uh, planning and environmental linkage study for I-25 North. So one of the priorities that we heard from the board was I-25 North, <clears throat> we really need to address um, and get that future project ready to go. So the board has asked CDOT to, to consider funding or funding a portion of that study. So CDOT Region 2 um, is proposing to fund a million of that three million study um, through Region 1, our sister region up north, to complete that in the next couple of years. Okay. So questions on this? Batch. Batch of projects. <laughs> and again, we're mainly, it's for informational link, mainly for 2020 projects. Just, just to make sure I'm not, I'm sorry. Like yeah, there are multiple people. <laughs> yeah. Just to make sure I understand this, on the million dollars that you just talked about going to the I-25 plan, is that that same million dollars that's up under eight? No. No, that million dollars is being held as a pool against the 21st and 31st Street. Correct. We're looking at maybe moving that million to 21st and 31st, so that money exists. There was a placeholder for a million in 2020 for 8th Street. Mm -hmm that we said, let's move that into that I-25 PEL study. So that's really the change, really, in the 2020 plan that we had originally in the draft plan. Okay. Um, how did you, question you raise your hand to? Thank you. Scott can go first. Yeah. I'm still. So is, is the planning on the I-25? Oh, oh, go, please go. Continue. Oh, I thought you weren't. No, continue. That was. Go ahead, Hal. Yeah, hold on, Bob. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Go. Okay, I'm, I, I finally got my question <laughs> squared away. If I look at your totals column off to the right here, I see um, Central Front Range, Pueblo, PPACG, South Central, and then Southeastern. Mm -hmm. um, and we. Fortunately, PPACG looks like it has the vast majority. Are those actually, are those the totals of the years of columns in here? So it, really what you want to focus on is the next sheet, and I haven't gotten to it yet. The 20, there is a total that's 16 through 25. It's the last column on the second sheet. That's the 10-year total that... If you're looking for equitability in terms of RPP, that's what you really want to look at. So if you look at uh, the different TPRs and MPOs, that funding is pretty darn close to the, um, the formulas that have been set up for those MPOs and TPRs. So if, for example, the $40 million in RPP we're getting over that 10-year period for Pikes Peak is about $4 million a year. Any more questions? Yeah. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, is the planning study then still a million dollars short? That was a three million dollar planning, and you've got two million accounted for. Is that correct? Correct. Region one is pro providing two million of that for a total of three million. Okay. Okay, Scott. And I just wanted to get a clarification on the Eighth Street and 24. So it might understand that if that design, the design that's currently posted on the website for the completion of the project incorporates any and all designs or alterations that may go to the 8th Street and 24 interchange. Because at one point there were two projects scheduled there, the I-25 and Cimarron, and then 8th Street and 24 Correct. was another project. So that project has been eliminated? Well, it, it, when I say eliminated, Funded, it's maybe is a better way to look at it. what we're really looking at with these the, this type of money because it's not 
the 270 million that we need to finish the 24 quarter, uh, the proposed action in the environmental document shows a full interchange at 8th Street. Right. Of course, that's probably a 40, 50, 60 billion dollar project, and and so what we wanted to do originally a year ago with this RPP money or that million was to say, what can we do at 8th Street to at least improve the safety and maybe some additional capacity through that intersection. So sure it's, it's more of an interim improvement, if you will. So the million that we took out, again, going to that planning study, will be compensated by the additional work that our contractor is putting into the Cimarron interchange. So we think that, yeah, we're not going to get, you know, um, a 50-year design out of that, but we're going to get a 10-year, maybe 15-year benefit from that and really reduce the congestion that we see at 8th Street. So we'll get some uh, safety that. improvements Correct. and ancillary benefit, but not the finished product. Not the, final, not the final proposed action is what we're calling it. And so any of those alterations in the traffic flow there on 8th Street and 24 are already on the website as part of the design plan? Correct. And I think generally what we're the, – the, the big benefit is there is we're putting in an, an additional street to, to go over to 8th Street. Uh, which will eliminate the majority of those left turns that are backing up yeah. into into uh, Cimarron, which is causing that westbound congestion. So it's really going to reduce that congestion at that intersection. And so we're going to get, again, a long-term benefit out of that. So, so again, um, I don't know if there's time or interest in to go through the next list, but, again, the next list really is – is a draft list, if you will. It's, it does show the 2020, and again, we're going to come back and request that these projects be added to the 2020 list. But um, skipping, you know, I talked about the PEL study. Um, the, the 21 quarter design um, we're, we're proposing, and, and again, there's time to, to talk about this, but you put a million dollars in 2022 uh, for additional design. And uh, State Highway 67 north of Witham Park, I know that design is being finished currently. And there's a desire to try to get that money um, funded sooner um, because I think the city would like to see that done sooner. So we're still showing that out at, at 2024. Um, but there may be future discussions about how we fund that with maybe a different type of funding. Um, and then additional funding at Ute Pass and Cascade. I know there's an interest to improve that intersection. Um, and then one of the ideas that uh, has been generating, being thrown around CDOT is ramp metering. And that would be the, the fourth or fifth project down called operational analysis. We'll probably put that money into a ramp metering project. We're short of money on that, but we'd like to explore options to to get that one ready to go. We did an analysis on, on ramp metering through Colorado Springs, and we think we can see some real benefit if we start to uh, install some ramp metering at certain locations. Um, additional water quality, um, we got that funded, so that one certainly currently shows a zero balance. It's funded with a different source. Um, the I-25 PEL study, again, I talked about that. Um, the Baptist Road payback, you can strike that and call that zero because that's done. I guess we should have corrected that. And again, the 8th Street design, right-of-way design at that intersection, we were proposing out in 2024 to put $4 million into that intersection. And then so as we look at the 24 corridor, uh, especially at 24th and 21st and 31st Street, um, we may have a desire to put that money uh, elsewhere, or we may decide to keep it at 8th Street if there's additional improvements we want to make. So, um, again, this is a draft list. It's, it's kind of a, our communication to the community about where we think where the money should go. So. That's all I had. Yep. Kevin? I have a question. It, look, it looks like after t 10 years you're balanced at $275,000, but there's cash flow problems. 
like in 2020 where you're 1.7 million dollars under how does how do you manage that that is a great question <laughs> um, we have a program at CDOT where we it's our rolling step any project that's funded within that four window four year window if it's a design project we can we can move that money forward and fund it today because what we have what we call a cash flow problem we have too much cash Oh, I so, don't have that problem. <laughs> okay, I know, I know. It's, it's, it's a unique problem. But So what we can do is take that money for design or utility relocation or right-of-way uh, purchases, and we can accelerate that money. So, for example, uh, the reason I'm, I'm presenting this today is that 2020 money, because it's within that four, it will be within that four-year uh, window, 17, 18, 19, 20 in our fiscal year, we can we can actually reach into 2020 and, and program that money this summer. So with construction, on the other hand, we have to have the project ready to go in it. And, but again, we can still use that, um, that rolling step to reach out and, and grab future money. So, um, it gives us a lot of options, even though we're showing we're short maybe in one year. Um, we can balance that. Okay. Mark, there, mm -hmm. there was a time when you were going to reduce all of that cash down to a certain level. Instead of having it be this huge amount, where are you in that process right now? It's, it is being reduced. I mean, part of that was with ramp. Um, our goal this year is to spend six hundred seven hundred and eighty million dollars, seven hundred ninety million dollars this year, statewide. That includes all the different funding programs, and so that's gonna that's gonna make a big dent in that that drawdown. Um, and then next year, I don't know the figures, but it's something similar. So the whole idea is we have a plan to, as we accelerated some of these projects like Cimarron and I twenty five and Fillmore. Um, um, and then Old Ranch, that we can um, draw down that cash balance sooner. And again, the four-year rolling step is part of that solution. Um, I just have a quick question. If when you when you show these projects and you show that some of them are in motion, I mean, but particularly planning studies, is there a way? to um, communicate or illustrate where those are in the planning configuration, you know, like is it, half, is it halfway through? Um, only because, I, you know, when I know, mm -hmm. if you're using the funds, what's the best way to show where we are down the road with that particular project? Because sometimes sure. when you say we made changes based on X, I'm going, how far down the road were they on that project? They haven't started. They've selected a consultant. Well, the two projects that we were referring to are the 24 right. PEL and the I-25 PEL. Right. Those two projects have not started. They've selected con consultants for each one of those. Okay. But when, when we establish our websites for each project, mm -hmm. a lot of that communication to the public will show where we are with, with, within that time window. For example, two years of planning, and then we go into a different phase and eventually construction. So some of that will come out in the planning study itself and address the schedule. So that's part of the, the scope. And just real quick, also, this is that, it's funny that the CAC is one who brings this up. This is, I think, the third time in the last seven years that, that almost that exact question has been asked. Where, how do we find out where each project is? We have actually a policy now that we haven't been following, but we are going to be, is every six months reporting project status. And mm -hmm. um, we asked the, at the TAC meeting last week, we asked, uh, we presented it, okay, we need your status on all these projects, and they're going to give that to us, um, hopefully by next month, and we'll be bringing that back through the process to report to the board. So twice a year now, at the, you'll be able to get an update on where all the projects are, and our e-tip, we're going to be putting our tip on the web in a more of an electronic format and as opposed to just a PDF that you can download it a more interactive that will also relay that information um, so but it's like I said the CAC you all have asked that question 
Yes. This is at least three times in the last six or seven years. So we're on it slow, but we are gonna gonna get there. You'll let us know when that's live. Then. Yep. Great. Uh, and, and on the uh, what was brought up, uh, Craig just brought up that we've requested the TAC to uh, come back and give us product annual project updates uh, uh, per fiscal year. Um, that's a twice a year reporting, uh, March and September. So hopefully we get responses back in time and we'll be on track. So just they know they're on the hot seat then. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. Any Thank other you. further questions for Mark? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Rachel, you are up. Good afternoon, Rachel Beck, Policy and Communication Manager. Our legislative session started about two weeks ago, and um, there's a number of bills that I've highlighted in your packet. And in addition, you all should have received by email our weekly legislative tracker. So I'm happy to talk about any of those bills that interest you in detail, but there's a few that I'd like to highlight for you quickly. I'm just going to pull that tracker up here. So the first one, um, I'm going to go through the ones that we have proposed either supporting or opposing as indicated in your tracker. The first one um, is looking at the Transportation Advisory Committee's procedures. Currently, the way that their charter is written, the State Transportation Advisory Committee, which includes representatives from our staff, Craig, uh, sometimes Rob, and Teller County Commissioner Norm Steen, um, sit on that committee um, and advise CDOT on our local priorities and matters relating to the regional transportation system and the statewide transportation improvement plan. Um, but their input does not go directly to the Transportation Commission. Um, and so the board has actually already taken a position on this bill that they would like to support the um, just as a way to further open lines of communication between local staff um, who have a tremendous amount of expertise and our Transportation Commission. Comments, questions on that one? Sense. All right. The next one um, deals with the membership on the Transportation Commission. Right now there are 11 Transportation Commissioners. They're assigned to districts. Um, those district boundaries have not been looked at since 1991. So this bill proposes doing a study that would look at um, the population, vehicle miles traveled, and other pertinent data in each of those districts and then um, make some recommendations on whether it would be a good idea to redraw those district boundaries. Now there's some controversy to this one um, because right now uh, the districts are weighted a little bit toward Denver. And so they're a little concerned that if we open this up to redrawing district boundaries that they're going to lose some of their say. So there's some ways to deal with that. We can look at options like weighted voting, for instance, or um, other similar ideas. So for now, this one is just a study to take a look at that. The board has also already decided to support this one. Thoughts on that one? I'm with them. Okay. <laughs> This next one is an interesting one. Um, I'm going to pull this up so you can look at it. I would characterize this bill as kind of a reaffirmation. Um, the way that these are written, all this text that you see here is already part of our state statutes. All that we're adding in this bill is this section right here that's in all capital letters. And so what this bill says is that uh, it kind of recaps a recent report on um, our military installations impact on our local communities, mostly in terms of economic impact. Um, talks about how important it is to our economy and our communities and emphasizes that in the transportation planning process, we need to make sure that we're looking at their needs and doing our best to address them. Um, and this particularly deals with that at the statewide level. Um, so as I said, this is already in current state statute. This is all that we're adding here, and it's just kind of strengthening the language. How? It's hard to read that. Could you read it for us, Rachel? The part in all caps? Yeah, please. 
coordination with federal military installations in the state to identify the transportation infrastructure needs of the installations and ensure that those needs are given full consideration during the formation of the state plan. Thank you. Scott. I, I actually like seeing that in there. Uh, with Fountain Metro Transit, we've tried for years to come to an agreement with Fort Carson to provide some services. They keep asking us to do it and then stopping the buses at the gate. And so we're trying to work on a method of actually helping transport a large number of active duty military personnel that live in our community uh, into the Fort Carson internal transportation system. So I appreciate having that in there. At least it means that there is an avenue for discussion. Okay, that's good feedback. It's kind of looking at it the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. It's the other side of the it is. That's right. You get both ends working towards the middle, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Andy Merritt in our office at the Regional Business Alliance has been very involved in this one. Okay. And actually the, the MAC requested that Dan Norberg sponsor this bill. And um, in part it adds language that is more consistent with other states. That, hmm. So it, this was a request that we've received um, from the military bases because for us to be competitive and realignment considerations on all of those things, a specific type of language um, was was important. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Oh, I think that was reiterated or um, highlighted at the board meeting as well. I mean, the two um, colonels that were there, I mean, I think what they did was they share, shared how important the working relationship is with our community particularly, so. I think also if we, if we had <laughs> A source of consistent funding for transportation, there would have been a, a potential funding allocation request mm. in this as well. So that could come down the down the pike later. Okay. If that's ever figured out. So, so I have not put this in as an action item um, for the CAC, but it would be helpful to me to have just a kind of an informal head nod. This is something staff will ask the board to support at our board meeting. So you know. If you could give me a general thumbs up, thumbs down, that, that's helpful information. Okay, thank you. Is there any value in having a formal statement, including a vote? From the CAC? Yes. Would we have to have a recommend? Um, or, or that we, um, you have monitor support or disagree? Right. So that's what I will ask the board for, but um, I think Hal's asking if a formal motion from the CAC would be helpful. I do think that would be helpful, but I'm... Jacqueline, can I put you on the spot? Can we do that if this was not listed as an action item on the agenda? Um, you don't, how quick do no, you? I think that just the consensus of support is sufficient. Okay. Thank you. Are you going to ask how quickly are these moving? Yeah. Well, I'm, Never fast. I'm glad you mentioned that because actually there are a couple of these that are moving quickly. Um, and I was a bit surprised. <clears throat> So uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee procedure has already been through committee um, and recommended unanimously to the floor. Um, that one I think is scheduled. And then um, there's one down here that has already been postponed indefinitely. So Which one? some of these are moving with some speed. Scott, did you have a question before I went on to the next one? Oh, no, I was thinking maybe you skipped the next one. So oh, okay. That's all right. Great. Next one is pretty straightforward. Um, regional transportation authorities, of which we have one, Pikes Peak Rural Transportation Authorities, um, are authorized under state statute to be able to ask voters for permission to use a property tax, a mill levy, in their districts. We do not use that option and um, in, probably won't in the foreseeable future. Um, that provision, though, will expire. I don't remember the year. I think it's 2019. Um, and the Roaring Fork Regional Transportation Authority, which is one of the few others in the state, would like to use that option in the future. So they have asked for this bill um, to extend that deadline, that option, for 10 years. And they have asked the PPRTA and PPACG to um, support that. So we see no... Issues with that? Oops. That was where my question was, was on that piece. What was the question? I'm sorry. Would a newly formed or to be formed regional transportation authority fall then automatically under that statute? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Um, this one is particularly interesting, Bill. This next one, which we will ask the board to oppose. This bill proposes um, repealing a requirement that certain amount of faster fees go to transit uses. Um, right now, that's $15 million per year. $10 million of that goes to CDOT for transit projects related to planning, design, engineering, um, and so forth of transit projects. $5 million goes to the State Transit and Rail Fund. So this, pill, this bill would remove that requirement, and instead those funds would be designated only for road safety projects. Um, locally, that would mean about $700,000 that Mountain Metro would no longer be receiving. Um, we've also heard from our, one of our CDOT regional reps that this would gut busting. Um, so, you know, we've talked extensively at this committee about the importance of transit options. PPACG is tasked with ensuring multimodal transportation in the region, and this would be a step back. Um, I'll also note that CDOT has opposed this bill. This has already gone through committee, so this is another one that moved, moved very quickly. Um, a CDOT also <coughs> testified against this bill, but it passed out of committee on a three to two vote. Yes. Well, um, Commissioner Steen was at the hearing, um, I believe it was yesterday or the day before, and what he was hearing was that the bill sponsor had some concerns um, about the number of people that transit benefits versus the needs, need for road and bridge um, safety and infrastructure projects. Um, so it sounds like there are some philosophical issues at play here. He also had a concern which, um, since I've just heard about this, I haven't had a chance to research that he felt that faster funds were intended for transit. Which is not true. Okay, can you t speak to that? Um, I mean, I, I just looked up the, the 2009 original bill and transit infrastructure is in, in the language, so I'm not really sure where, where that's coming from. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, you're talking about the <laughs> five million of it being for for rail and transportation, then, for other means than just infrastructure piece. Yes, 15 million, yep. all told, per year. Okay, 15 is the total. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's two subcategories within that 15 million. So he proposes it changes mm -hmm. to all infrastructure. Yeah, road safety specifically. Okay. Well, and Neville is the sponsor. Um, sponsored a bill last year that did. I mean, same intent is to to repeal faster. Um, and they have issues with it philosophically on it being a fee that doesn't align mm. with Tabor, um, essentially that it's a, it's a fee that isn't technically a fee, it should just be a tax and it's being mis, I don't know, it's, I can send out a, a blog that explains some of the background a little more sufficiently, but um, a lot of it is more philosophically like whether, whether faster is even legitimate, and so and previously they'd attacked faster as a whole and, and wanted to repeal it in general, and this year it's kind of being reframed and taking a specific focus on transit. Mm. So. Thank you, that's helpful. Doing yeah. some research, we should talk. Oh, okay, Scott is saying that some of these funds go to local nonprofit uh, service providers as well. This is another one where uh, I would appreciate kind of a general consensus if there is one on your thoughts on this bill. Um, is there a consensus that we would oppose this? Mm -hmm. is, we we okay. would go along with the, what the rest of our... Uh, yes, you'd like to say no? <laughs> yes, we'd like to say no. We should say no to this. Do, can, can you raise your hands? I have a vested interest in that one. I have to abstain from okay. voting. I'm going to abstain because I don't have enough knowledge you know. okay. to make a decision. I've seen. I'm going to abstain until I find out whether Neville T and Neville P are the same person. <laughs> <laughs> father, father and son. Or are they ah, related? There you go. Father and son. Oh, ah, they, they well, good. Up, All right, well, then I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll just mention, too, that it'll probably fly through the Senate being Republican-controlled, but, I mean, it, it'll probably get stymied in, in the... House what did Senate. you say, Courtney, at the end? It'll probably uh, be, get stymied in, in the House, just with the Democratic-controlled House. So. Which it's 
not really. Never mind. Can I ask a question? <laughs> what is the um, what is the required percent that goes towards transit? It's not a percentage. It's a dollar amount. So out of out of all faster funds. There's 15 million that's designated towards transit. That's right. What is that? Is it is it one percent? Is it 99 percent? I don't know. Mark, can you I, answer that? I this? thought it was around 10. Okay. But I. <clears throat> so it's a relatively small portion, whatever yeah. the exact number is. Okay. We've we've had that discussion. Before Thank you. We were introduced. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the the other part that was just uh, I I don't know who mentioned it, but uh, a lot of not for profits that are delivering services. Uh, benefit from these dollars, correct? I mean, Silver Key, uh, I know Goodwill does. I mean, there's, there's quite a list of them. Uh, Metro Transit. Yeah, I'm looking, yeah. Yeah, all of our local service providers, uh, the funding is split up. There's a regional pool of faster dollars that uh, annually um, the region MMT receives about $700,000. Are on average, they uh, th the funding is very important for uh, because the funding can be utilized for capital cost, so they can go out and buy new vehicles. The other funding for the nonprofits, again, it's, there's some of it's a, it's a competitive state pool. We have a very good uh, uh, mobility coordinating committee. They works really well together to uh, select projects on an annual basis and move forward. We got notification actually today. Uh, on our faster funds for FY uh, 16 and 17, in which MMT will be receiving $700,000. Uh, I believe it's Amplicabs receiving $184,000 for body, cha uh, body, chas body on chassis improvements or replacements. Uh, these are these funds are necessary for capital improvements, keeping the vehicles up to up to code, up to up to par, and, and getting people yes yeah, safe. And getting people safely from, to their medical appointments and other necessities, uh, just for general living, and and so I think this is a very valuable uh, uh, program, and you know it'd be great for us to support uh, faster and not support this bill. <laughs> All right, thanks. Any other thoughts on that one? All right, that's all that I have pulled out um, to highlight. Are there any others on this list that you want to talk about? Or have questions about? I just have a question. Um, I understand all the transportation ones. I'm a little, I'm a, I'm a little um, curious as to why. Not that I, I am not interested in because ones that have to do with healthcare, just because of my background or I'm interested in and follow. But I'm going. How did these get pulled to our relationship? I mean, some of them seem like a stretch. I, I track anything that will affect our programs at PPACG. So the healthcare-related ones that you see are because of our area agency on aging, and there are a lot that the ombudsman expect will um, increase their calls for service and affect what they do in the community. Um, or there are also a number on this list that may affect our, our member government operations, and so those are included as well. And sometimes there's some that are kind of on the edge of whether they should be included or not. And um, I usually discuss those with our program managers and just see what they think, what kind of a, an effect it would have or not. I just put question marks next to those because I haven't had a chance to look at them to go, okay, you know, connect the dots. So, Yes, Bob, you have a question? Uh, Rachel, when you said they're moving through very quickly, uh, is that that is a concern of yours when they are moving quickly? But then Courtney was saying they'll be stymied in house. in the house. Uh, so I, I, when you when you refer to something moving through committee very very quickly, even though it was what a three two vote, uh, was the that only... along party lines or? Oh, sure. It was. Yeah. Thank you. I hadn't looked. Uh, you know, it's only a concern if there's one that, that uh, we would like to weigh in on. And because we, ha we go through a process of bringing these bills to you, um, the TAC also discussed a number of these, and then the board takes a formal position. Sometimes that process takes long enough that it's out of committee before we can even give our input. And that can be a concern because 
uh, it's a lot easier to discuss the merits of a bill in a committee when there are fewer members than when it goes to the entire floor. It's also an opportunity to make changes if changes are necessary. Yep. Well. Can you give us 30 second summary of the EPA clean power rule legislation? Sure. That's just personal interest. Thank you. Second to the bottom. Preserve options. Ah. Down. Thirty three. Thirty three. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I have to refresh my memory a little bit on this one. This one um, is an attempt to retain some local control over the clean power plant plan rules. I always try and say plant. Um, and giving us a little more time to submit a plan on how to meet those requirements. Um, it can be a lengthy process when you have an entire state that has to work together on a plan to address, um, I can't remember now how many hundreds of pages those regulations were. And it, um, we're also required to do a statewide public process. Um, so there are some that feel that that's, there isn't enough time to do all that and do it well. How much of this is driven by the court action? I noted that there's a reference in there to if the court stays the implementation. Why go, it, the, what I read was, what it seemed to me it said, why go through all this bloodletting here if it's not going to be implemented nationally? Mm -hmm. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, you're right. That was a consideration. That help, Hal. Thank you. Could you just go up just for a quick look at the prohibited slow moving vehicles? Living in a county that's got lots of tractors <laughs> out the road, I'm curious about what, what do they plan on proposing? There's already <laughs> legislation that says if you obstruct you it, you can get a ticket. Yeah. This is a fun one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is another one that probably would fall under the category of strengthening the language. Um, it gets a little more specific and specifies five or more motor vehicles oh, as a this definition. This is about farmers and stuff. This is about people in cages, right, or cars. Motorcycle uh, <laughs> <laughs> riders have a bad habit of saying cages. Um, in their personal cars driving down highways impeding right traffic. Correct. Okay. Okay. And it does. Because that was going to cause some heartburn if that was you know, people in a tractor trying it would, to. It would apply to them also. Yeah. There is a safety stipulation in here, though. So if you need to operate your vehicle at a slow speed to be safe and you've got traffic backed up behind you, this, you would be all right. Because of the pass, somebody who can't, like a flatlander who can't pass, <laughs> because it's snowing. <laughs> That's not specified. So far, you need to be able to ride a motorcycle on ice to keep up with you. Is what I'm yeah. So, yeah. All right. Thank you for listening. Okay. <laughs> Just interestingly, and for discussion, is the State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee the kill committee? Oh, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. So this is unlikely to um, continue through the process. There's a, there's a committee in each house that the majority leader or that or the uh, – the kill committee. Whoever names the committees sends these bills to these committees because they know that they're and they're they're on the committee to vote no or vote yes, whichever. Vote no mostly. Yeah. So that I think is the Senate kill committee. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or thoughts? If you ever see these or look at the bill tracker and you have any questions, ask Rachel because there are the bill tracker is really interesting. I mean, I, I like to follow it. So. I'm glad you think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. Well, I appreciate this a lot because I will go back now and look at, every, look at the ones that, that, that we need to look at. Read the whole you always Thank get you. the opportunity to get a hold of your legislator. I do. I do have one question. I'm not sure where to address it. Um, I had a, a group of people that mentioned, and I'm not sure if anybody else in here saw it, and because PPACG is um, 
directly involved with our water quality. Um, there was an article in the New Yorker magazine. Did anybody else see that? And I haven't gotten the full text of the article. I got a, um, an edited version um, about hydrocarbons in our water. And we were, Colorado Springs was listed as the number four place in the country. So if you can just ask about it, because all of a sudden that became a concern, and this just this just was a week ago, actually not even a week ago, it was last Thursday, hmm. that it was mentioned in a in a setting a, a group that was meeting that I'm involved with. So. Okay. Do we even measure hydro, hydro, hydrocarbons in the water? I haven't seen that on the water quality information. Yep, Scott. We just capped two wells down in Security and Whitefield because of that. Wow. Because of that. Okay. So there is something yeah, to the. The thinking is, is because that water was intermixed with yes. all of the rest of the wells, that the dilution was such that it was below EPA minimums, but those wells were capped. Okay, because I, I went, it's not going to get mentioned in that level of um, a publication yeah. unless it has come off of a piece of research mm -hmm. and it was significant. So if you could follow up with this and let us know, mm, you, um, that'd be you know, I don't think I ever heard Rich Muzzy mention sampling hydrocarbons in the water supply in any of the tributaries of the rivers? I think it's the tracking mechanism. It's the way that they have to be tracked in the source. So it's, it's pulling back. So I'm just not sure of the detail. So that's, that's interesting that you say that. I've never heard it either. Yeah, how? Well, I'm on the um, groundwater quality committee for the Squirrel Creek Basin, as it's so called out, out east there. And most of the concern is about phosphates and nitrates, mm -hmm. which Fertilizer come from surface agricultural activity. Mm -hmm. There were one or two spots where they picked up what, what they call uh, total organic compounds. I can't recall the exact acronym that they use, THX, something like that, um, which is anything that will show up as an organic compound, benzene, gasoline, things of that nature. There were only two wells out of the number that were tested. They don't think they have a problem, but those wells, you know, probably sites of old maintenance shops or something. So I don't know what other... I, mean, I don't think it's just two wells to be num mentioned number four in the country. I mean, I'm just not sure of what the source is, and I'm not sure of the fact that it appeared in a national publication was kind of a concern. I'm so just you to call at utilities, so I will be back. Great. Thank you. Now, where did you see this, Jan? It was what? in the New Yorker magazine. Mm -hmm. And it was a study, yes, last last week. Okay. Um, do we have any other items that we'll need to put on the next CAC meeting? Yep, Craig. I have one. You do? So, as you know, we did a call for TIP projects. And the purpose of the TIP is to implement the long-range plan. Uh, the long-range plan was adopted in November. And we ju we've gotten 19 applications for projects to fund to implement the long-range plan. However, it turns out in looking at those projects that 17 of the 19 applications are not included in our long-range plan. The projects that were submitted for funding are not the projects that are in our long-range plan. That's a problem. Nice. <laughs> Seems like it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, one of the uh, 17 was actually submitted as a long range plan project, but not selected because it scored so low. The other 16 um, are new projects that just. They're, yeah, they're different. So we're going to mention that to the board. What the federal re regulations say the tip is to implement the plan. 16, 17 out of 19, it's tough to argue that you're implementing the plan if they're uh, not in it. So, Did those, did, you know, I mean, for with your opinion, did 16 of those projects, did any of them, were any of them contiguous to projects that we know that are going forward? Because um, I guess what I've got, sometimes <laughs> fix one thing and it, it, it's attached to another issue. The issues that the, the um, uh, not small number that these are attached to are actually stormwater. Um, we've got bridge projects that the bridge has got a 97 rating, but they're doing 
associated drainage improvements. Um, so that's there's uh, the, it looks like they're trying to fund some stormwater issues with transportation money. No. <laughs> yeah. Really. <laughs> so. Who thought? Um, but we're we're just gonna, we don't know what to do because the federal requirements are pretty clear. TIP is supposed to implement the plan. It's possible that you can do a plan amendment and then put the projects in the TIP. But the fact that we adopted the plan two months ago, Federal Highway is going to look at that. See that'll probably look at that and go, what? Are there no projects we need to implement? There's in the plan? Appar <laughs> apparently they're not. Yeah, and. Um, so that's one of the things. So you'll be seeing that next month is some, you know, how do we address this issue? Yeah. Okay. Well, but we'll mention it to the board next week because we, I mean, it's pretty clear on the regulations. And 17 out of 19 is kind of stunning. So. Is there any correlation to all of these projects showing up in the fact that the city just hired 20 additional people to deal with stormwater? I what? couldn't speculate on that. 20 positions so. right after the uh, pothole so. tax was passed? So, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's an issue, and, and in some ways, Our it certainly is related to transportation. <laughs> so, it's but, speculation. Um, we'll, we'll be looking for, um, for that. Uh, also, next month, you'll be seeing, hopefully, the project status report of the projects as we talked earlier. So, thank you. Yes. I'd like to uh, see if there is a role for this committee to every once in a while touch base with the joint land use study that's going on. There isn't, I, I, I noticed that the group that uh, is put together to do that, the working group, does not have a you know, general citizen kind of component to it. Uh, and since the military is so important to our long-term economic future that uh, it would be helpful if we could stay somewhat abreast of that so that as that thing moves forward, whether there's good things or bad things that are going on, we could help them. You can uh, mention that, that for us. So, we uh, talked about that one. Yeah. So I'd like to see if we could just get some every once in a while, maybe it's every quarter or every six months or some kind of report on that. I already asked them for next month. Oh, thank you. Great. But I'm glad to have you on record. <laughs> Okay, any other member announcements? Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, I'll just have adjournment by consensus. Yes, Okay, see you next thank month. You. We need to schedule a meeting. Yes, we do. But I knew two of the guys were not going to be here today. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So, you need to send an email. Do you want me to do another Google poll? Or you, want to you know what? Yeah, doodle is kind of tough. You know what works? Oh, well, I can be there. I can be there. And then I also want to, I need to go through that document because I need to see if our committee has any potential conflict. Oh, okay. Their terms. Ah, got it. So that's the lowest one. That's the lowest one. I gotta be careful in choosing the chair to make sure that. Okay.